Uh, thank you so much for, for joining uh, Pioneer Works and the Studio Museum here today, where we've joined uh, in the digital sphere for a very special conversation uh, between the amazing artists and curators of Brand New Heavies. Uh, we're just really honored to, to be here today. This, this exhibition has been a long light at the end of the, uh, the COVID tunnel. Um, and it's amazing to be sitting here inside uh, one of the sculptures. Uh, my name is Gabriel Florenz. And I really want to kind of give a shout out to those who make this all possible. Uh, if it weren't for the, the Ford Foundation, Gucci, um, we might not be able to, to, to do this very ambitious project. So thank you so much to them. Uh, curators Raquel Chevremont and Micheline Thomas have been really dear friends of ours for a long time. Uh, outside of their work as art, an art advisor and an artist, Raquel and Micheline formed the, the curatorial moniker Du Femme Noir, dedicated to the important work of increasing visibility and opportunities for artists of color. They first brought the idea for Brand New Heavies, I think about, it was about two, over two years ago. Um, and, you know, it's been a long time coming and, and uh, here, here we are today. We, um, we were really, you know, for a long time, a lot of names were, were bounced around and uh, the, the three they came to were, were just this, uh, this perfect pairing. Um, so we have Abigail DeVille, Xavier Simmons, Rosa Johan Uda, uh, and they all were invited here to create newly commissioned works, um, all kind of like giving, they really gave them the freedom, they wanted scale and size and really just like let them blossom in the space and make sure that they were kind of in conversation with each other to, uh, to form what we have here today. Um, and to kind of like, Put all these pieces together and and take us through this journey uh we have uh, Thelma golden uh from the studio museum in harlem uh she we want to thank her a lot for for agreeing to do this she uh she's the the chief curator and the museum's director uh and we also have uh dion huff who is the institution's uh director of public programs and community engagement she'll be also moderating the q a portion of this event uh, Micheline, Abigail, uh, Xavier are all, all also former artists and residents at the Studio Museum. Um, also, Abigail is uh, an artist resident here. So they all have a kind of long history together. So it's been uh, nice to see them all form here today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and turn it over to Thelma, Raquel, Micheline. I thank them all so much for, uh, for doing this, for being part of our lives here. Uh, it's been really special. So. Um, Please enjoy, stay with us. Thank you, Gabriel, and good evening, everyone. It is so fantastic to be here. In a moment where cross-institutional collaboration feels so urgent, so necessary, I wanna thank our colleagues at Pioneer Works for inviting the Studio Museum to be in conversation around this incredible and timely exhibition, Brand New Heavies. Brand New Heavies is a powerful curatorial project presenting multi-dimensional narratives that complicate and expand our understanding of history, place, identity, aesthetics, and politics, and so much more. Tonight's conversations organized around the exhibition is especially meaningful given that, as Gabriel said, there are many ties from the past to the Studio Museum, but also, including Rosa here, also ties to our present. So thrilling to have this way of thinking about institution through this conversation. As Gabriel noted, Micheline Zaveri and Abigail each participated in the Museum's Artists in Residence program, a foundational program that the museum continues over 50 years later. It's been an honor and a privilege to watch their practices expand and evolve over the years. And this profound curatorial collaboration between Raquel and Micheline shows us the generative possibilities that emerge when we create space for the presentation of new and expanded art histories. So without further ado, let's begin. Hello, Micheline and Raquel. Um, I'm so glad that you can join me now. And for the audience, I'd like to say we'll be bringing Abigail Rosenzaveria into the conversation shortly. But first, Micheline and Raquel, congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Look at these smiles. <laughs> this is a long time coming. We're just so happy that it's uh, 
and it finally came to fruition. So yeah. thank you. Well, I want you to talk about that road, but but first, before we get here, I want to acknowledge the fact that this project comes out of a project conceived by the two of you, a collaboration, a platform, a position that you've created <coughs> to support the work of artists. So can you talk about Du Femme Noir and how it came to be? And then I'd love for you to begin to talk about how you came to this exhibition. So we had uh, started talking many years ago about um, trying to figure out a way that we could use our voice and our platform um, to help bring other uh, people um, like us up, right? Um, to help bring other women of color and, and queer, um, create a, a space um, that we saw was, was really not, um, uh, did not exist uh, for the most part outside of the Studio Museum, right? And so it's, and I it think, kind of, it well, just, uh, it was an it, organic. I think also it, it was that, but it was also the fact that Raquel being who she is, you know, already, you know, starting her salon at her, you know, brownstone and inviting artists to, you know, speak about their art and book publications and so forth. And she was already sort of an advocate for artists, you know, being on, you know, the board and involved with museums and, Th that nature and I think me being who I am artists were coming to us for a variety of reasons you know asking questions about navigation of their own career personal attributes and things like that and so we just kept getting all of these young emerging artists asking questions of the how to's or looking at contracts or advice and so we decided to like come Thank together collaboratively and Put our resources to support because we were doing that anyway <laughs> and we were doing it in some ways separately but then we realized that we could do it and be better forces if we did it together and so that's how De Femme Noirs really came about it was a really organic process and it was I thought beautiful because Raquel was doing what she was doing I was doing what I was doing and sort of this magic happened and we just like let's just let's just support some artists who, who need direction. Um, but also who, who need that, the platform that the we platform, were, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, we were lucky enough to get to a certain level where this became accessible to us and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, people were approaching us. And so we're like, now's the time. So you both use the term platform. How would you describe Du Femme Noir? Is it an organization? Is it a curatorial project? Is it a residency project? Is it a consultancy? Hopefully all of those things <laughs> one day. But right now I would say like a mentorship or ad, ad, you know, like an advisory sort of platform. You know? But also curatorial. Really? So it's it's kind yeah. of a it's a combination of things. We would love to open up a, a residency and we've been in conversation about that and, and trying to figure out how to do that. that would be the next step. Yep, yep. Um, right now, it's just using our own resources mm -hmm. and um, and people that are very you know generous mm -hmm. and in our lives that want to support us um, and passing that on. Yeah. So at the center of this collaboration have been curatorial projects, and I'd like to get to now brand new heavies, which now we have on the screen. So for um, our audience, who I want to thank for being here with us in this virtual way, you, Raquel and Micheline, you all are at Pioneer Works now, sitting yeah. in the exhibition, but on the screen, we have images that can take our audience through the installations themselves. Can you talk about the genesis for the idea for this project, brand new heavies? Um, so we were given, you know, like Gabriel said, we were in conversation with him about potentially doing something in the space and knowing the space well, um, we really wanted to uh, bring artists that we knew could work in large scale that had not been given the opportunity yet to work in large scale. And, and it's so rare, uh, that women get that opportunity that we knew we wanted it to be women. Um, and so we just, and we knew that they each have like distinctive visionary practices that they could bring forth mm -hmm. to this environment and this space that is monumental on, in scale and its own architectural space. 
and we knew that the artists that we would bring to, you know, the forefront would have no problem, right? Like just tackling it and sort of bringing something new and experience and, and perhaps with the commission creating a new body of work or working a material that they haven't worked they haven't sort of done before. And that and they so, maybe had been thinking about for a long time, mm -hmm. but you know, never had the opportunity, the space or the funding to be able to see it through. And so Pioneer Works was amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they approached us and they said, think big, shoot it out of the park, yeah. and then we'll scale it back if we have to. And we never hear that yeah, no. from any yeah, institution. No, I know. No. <laughs> it's no. never like, go for and, everything. And us, and then and us we'll being artist-centered, you know, and focused on supporting and helping them achieve their own personal creative goals, we were very excited about this opportunity. Really? You know, we were excited about this opportunity to collaborate it with PW and bring, like, we knew they were going to be women artists of color. We didn't know at the beginning, like who we had a long list that yeah. became a short list that became a long list, short list, you know, you know how it goes. <laughs> and so moving from one column to the next, but we always had our top artists that we really wanted to work with. So, and like for Zyberia, I was like, I was like, throwing in like really her in and like really her in and just saying, look, we're going to take care of you. We are going to take care of her. She had a very busy schedule, but she was always on our top list. And I was just like, I really want. And at that, that point we had already had Abigail committed yeah. and Rosa. And so it was like, okay, the third artist that we really want to give, you know, that we know can command the space, space. with the other two artists is like here. And she, she was like, well, I'm too busy to do this. And then it, then she was like, all right. Yeah, um, we just kept circling it. back. We were inviting another third person, but that would never really felt right. And yeah. I was just like, it's, we gotta I have to go back to her. I just have to go back to her and let her know that we're going to make, make sure that she has the support needed to, you know, have her vision come to fruition. It seems this project comes out of the fact that both of you are deeply involved, invested in an artist community. Yes. Can you talk a bit about that, Raquel, from your perspective as someone who's a curator, an advisor, a collector, someone who has existed within all those roles? And then, Michalina, I'd love for you to talk about it from your perspective as an artist. Well, I, um, uh, I mean, for many years ago, I, I, I realized that, you know, artists needed, needed support and, um, and I had the, I was able to help, right? So I created the salon. Um, out of my brownstone to invite artists. But <clears throat> the other part of that is artists also need collectors <laughs> and, and curators and writers to know about them and to know about their work. So the salon really brought all of these people together. Um, and, and we created some amazing stuff. It was actually, I was partnered with Isolde Brielmeyer, who's also an, an incredible curator. And, um, and then through that, I realized, you know, there are a lot of um, collectors of color or people that want mm -hmm. to collect but feel like they were left out mm -hmm. or, or they are intimidated. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to try to demystify the art world and bring more collectors that look like me. Um, there weren't enough when I would go to shows um, and and there weren't enough for my generation either. So when you did see someone of color, it was generally an older generation. And so the younger generations didn't really think about collecting or joining museums in some sort of a, you know, advisory or acquisitions or even the board. Um, so it became my mission to try to, uh, to change that. Um, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> when Michaeline and I got together, it was just like, okay, this is this we is. We were amazing. very excited about yeah. like our individual uh, perspectives and 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 means to want to create community for others. And I think, from my perspective as an artist, I I've always often felt um, like a lack of community and support with some of. Uh, older artists and I, I, you know, like, even though they were given back in some ways, I felt like some of those communities were very insular and I, di I didn't know how to tap into them <laughs> to, to, to ask questions or be involved in, in finding uh, 
the answer of how to navigate my own studio practice in the business of it, right? I felt somewhat lost. And I knew from that particular space inside that I always wanted to uh, provide uh, opportunity and answers for, for artists coming up after me. And so really early on in my career, I, in 2009, I curated my first show right after my solo show at Lehman Maupin. It was at Colette Blanchard Gallery. And um, I kind of got the buzz and the excitement to just doing that, providing space for other artists felt really rewarding. You know, it, it, it was like allowing the, the self ego of the artist taking that out, right? And really wanting others and seeing them shine and grow in their own sort of success as an artist um, really gives me great joy. And um, just, it just continued throughout my own trajectory and my own sort of creative process thinking about how I, as I grow as an artist, how I can create opportunities and space for other artists, instead of waiting until I say, oh, when I get to that moment, right? When is that moment? The moment's now, right? You don't have to wait until you have a certain amount of, you know, finances or money. You can start creating communities and building that wherever you are. And I realized that I could do that and whatever level I was as an artist, I can start creating opportunity for others. Thank you for that. So one more question before we bring these incredible artists into this conversation with us. Can you tell us how you came to the title of this exhibition and what the title means in relation to the works and the artists selected? Um, <clears throat> we were struggling at, at first. We were like, oh, what should we title this and then we realized you know Micheline had curated a show that won at Colette Blanchard um in 2009 and that was titled Brand New Heavies. It was, it was titled the Brand New Heavies and I just really liked sort of the the name of it with it the statement that it sort of provided around a group of artists and also what it meant for like the acid jazz band you know about soul and funk and sort of like this deconstructive sort of nature and collaboration of like objects or things or move or movements and so this was a new decade mm -hmm. right uh since that show had um had uh debuted really mm -hmm. and so we felt like oh let's let's just do this again i mean <laughs> um it's such a perfect title yeah. for for what we're doing here yeah it just seemed like the you know bring it in that title and be having the artist being considered as the new heavies, you know, mm -hmm. with the ability to utilize the like desperate sources and materials and medias of their work and what that really means for the art and the spaces and how they can individually bring these multi layer narratives that offer this sort of complex understanding around like histories and identities and politics and place. Great. Thank you for that. I now would love to ask Xaveria, Abigail, and Rosa to join us. So wonderful to see all three of you and congratulations to all three of you. This is an amazing exhibition in the conversation it creates between your works, but also really powerful and profound testaments to your own individual practices. It was so wonderful to spend time um, in the works uh, with Raquel and Michaelin and to really feel right the sense and spirit of the work that all of you are making. So I'd like to begin by just asking each of you um, to reflect on the work that you have in this exhibition. As Raquel and Micheline said, this project sort of comes with this sense of commission, but also a provocation, right? I mean, they, they, they asked you to think in space and scale in ways that I'd love for you to reflect on as you tell us about your contribution to the exhibition. And I'm gonna start with Severia. Hi, it's so thank you, Thelma. And it's so nice to see everyone. And that was a really great conversation. I've known these beautiful people for so long. So it's 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 always amazing. And um, I feel very lucky um, and blessed to be able to have these conversations. Um, um, I, you know, as Micheline said, I mean, I've known Micheline and Raquel for 15, 20 years. I have no idea. And 
I was, you know, really afraid actually, to be really honest, because they said, go big, you know? And I was like, oh my God, I, I have other projects. And they were very, you know, Michalina and Raquel were very persistent with me and very um, clear on kind of, you know, the level of support that was gonna be given. So I just, I had, I had a sketch that I really want, I've been, I've been thinking about. I actually, um, you know, I kept thinking about this object, this, 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 this using earthen materials and using, using um, different types of materials besides the earthen materials to make the work. And, you know, Michalina Raquel and Pioneer Works just came through with thinking about who could make the balls with me, which, which was fabulous. And then also adding other elements into this structural work. So I really, um, wanted to think of something that was very sensual. I wanted to think of something that was very politically engaged, historically engaged, and also kind of um, thinking about where we are right now, where we were in terms of COVID and the, the, the kind of revolution that we've witnessed. So all of those things, but also really thinking about the sensual, that was something that was really important to me when, when, when making this work and obviously the historical and art historical. So I, I guess, I hope that answers your question. I feel like I kind of went on my own tangent. It, it does, Zai, but you created a sculpture, right? This, this installation, as well as an animation. How does this relate to your ongoing practice? How is it related? How does it move? away from it, but explore um, similar ideas. So I had just come off of working, um, having a show at um, Socrates Sculpture Park, where I, you know, ground that project really on material, which was like thinking about plaster, thinking about large scale works, and also thinking about repair, black history, reparations, um, thinking about, you know, how, you know, 40 acres and a mule and all of those, all of those kind of like intense um, conversations that we've been having much more freely now. Um, and I really wanted to continue in that conversation. While I do make a lot of different types of work, I do respect traditions. And I really wanted to continue in that conversation. So I still wanted to explore material. So that would be the, the sculptural work. I also, you know, animation, you know, the animations, it's, it's really difficult. You know, you can make foot photography, you can make films and sound, but there are some emotions that, there's an emotional core that I cannot pull in photography or sculpture for me. I have to do it in a form that is like difficult for me to navigate and that would be animation. And, and, and the emotional states of the characters inside of the animations, um, you know, they, they're, it's very straightforward, you know, it's a, it's a struggle. There's a struggle in the animations and I wanted it to feel like something both playful and, and childlike, but also something very serious. And then there's obviously the sensual, um, video works, which, you know, coming out of a pandemic, coming out of a revolution in a way, I really wanted to think about um, touch. I wanted people to walk into the space and, and, and immediately feel both excited, in awe, turned on, calmed, kind of enraged, and also let it all land, which is why I, I, I the, the language inside of, which we can talk about, the language inside of the, the text work is really about your mind, how you process things as they're coming out or coming to you. So that's, that's a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rosa, you are a artists working in video and moving image. And your work takes on this kind of exploration of places in history, but also a look in a deep way at British popular culture through the lens um, of race. And I would love for you to talk about your um, two contributions to this exhibition and the sort of context from which your work emerges. Yeah, so I've got two acts in the exhibition. One is Black Poirot, 
um, which is a uh, yeah, big 20 minute um, video and sound installation. And the other one is Performing Witness, which is a um, three screen uh, video installation. And the whole is three smaller works in series, but it lasts about, I think, uh, 15 minutes the whole run. Um, thinking about Black Poirot, I was really excited because we were talking a long time, I think, with Rakao and McAleen about which work I'd possibly show. and. Obviously, uh, me being in London and it being a pandemic that complicated things, especially when talking about how to make monumental work <laughs> when you can't physically be in the space. So that was a real challenge. But um, I think uh, we had a discussion one time about um, they really wanted they, they were, we were talking about how um, a black British voice could could be represented in the show and I was really excited when Raquel was like, what about Black Poirot? And this is a work that I had made, um, that I'd started making a while ago, but on a much smaller scale with no budget. And I was just really excited. I was like, great, because I had no idea whether Poirot as a detective, as a character has has really traveled and has relevancy in, in New York, but also it's quite, uh, so I was excited to know that it, it would transfer, but also excited to present something so niche. Um, I really think that the work is kind of made for uh, people who are interested in critical race theory, but also who love Agatha Christie. And that's a very um, <laughs> uh, funny intersection of people, but I'm so glad that, um, yeah, it kind of resonates in, in New York as well. So, um, yeah, with that work, it was just really great because I could make uh really spend some time getting the sound mix really perfect and working with a sound designer joe nami to do that um i was really interested in um black i'm really interested in black sound culture and um how a lot of my work deals with how different performances in popular culture influence what we think of as black identity. Um, so for me, um, sound is quite an interesting place because it kind of gives you a little bit of an escape from the visual potentially. Um, it's, uh, we're so used to blackness being defined by these visual performances and these very like distinct aesthetics, I think. And for me, working primarily with sound was an opportunity to kind of put a pin in that and um, be a bit more expansive in thinking about black identity and um, investigating black identity as I think Poirot would do if they were black. So um, yeah, uh, that that was kind of where it sits in my practice. I mean, the other part of it was that I got to work with collective text to do to make a um, um, a captioned version of this sound work which again is just a really exciting way to work and to expand a work that was primarily conceived to be listened to, um, but to really kind of go deeper into the politics of accessibility, especially um, for a black non-hearing audience. Um, yeah. And I'd love for you to, to, you touched on this, but I'd love for you to expand a little more because, you know, we are used to a contemporary art world where works travel across borders and these ideas move freely. But in this moment, with movement confined, your work is here in New York, in New York audience. Um, you were not able to be here with the work, but how do you imagine, how did you imagine, how did you perhaps aspire for the work to translate or to live in the environment of the exhibition? Yeah, I think um, for me, I was quite interested in um, taking a, f ta I mean, I guess with if we talk specifically about Black Poro, um, I think Agatha Christie, Murder Mysteries, that kind of upper class Downton Abbey lifestyle is still what a lot of people internationally think of when they think of when they think of the UK when they think of England and um I so I kind of wanted to play with that um 
global perception of what it is to be British in this work. And um, that's one of the reasons it's so exciting to show this internationally. I've never shown in America before. So um, it's, yeah, it, it gives you, it gives me that um, option to open a conversation around that. Like what are the popular ideas of Britain outside the UK? Um, and then I think another thing that I really wanted to kind of work with was um, I think that um, black culture, understandably so, I think is really dominated a lot by um, American culture. And um, I hope that my work kind of shows that because I think that a lot of the inf a lot of the references in my work are like um, leading um, American critical race theorists such as you know Christina Sharp and Sadia Hartman who are like also equally huge over here um, I think that I really wanted to show them but then like mixing with other uh, diasporic thinkers such as Edward Glisson who is cast in the role of Black Poirot in the film but also um, paint British painters such as um, Lebena Himid um, and to really show this kind of um, mixture <laughs> uh, to present some references that will be really well known, I think, to some people in the US, but then some lesser known and see how they sit together for audiences. Thank you. Abigail, your practice has been defined by site specificity and scale. Can you talk about the inspiration behind the works that you created for this exhibition? Sure, I think uh, I started thinking about the Capitol Dome specifically through the sculpture that sits on the top of it. Uh, Thomas Crown's, what is the, the original title? I think he called it Freedom, Triumphant and War and Peace. And so it's this compositive woman and it's, it's thinking through this goddess Libertas, right? Like, taking, thinking about the ways in which power has been or the mythology of America has been put forward in through architecture and these monumental sculptures and the kind of slow and passive way that that's ingested and how we view ourselves through that uh, supposed lens of greatness, which is like hearkening back to ancient forms. So Libertas in particular was a goddess that manumated slaves and so in, in Roman society. And so immediately that there's a there's a critique that happens and you know all kinds of edits and it's not libertas at the top of that building. It ends up being this composited body. She gets a helmet instead of the pilus cap she's supposed to have of Minerva, uh, the goddess of war, and then some eagle feathers on there with a reference to an Indian princess. And so we're thinking through these kinds of like I'm thinking through these kinds of decimated bodies that also happen to be potentially personified as female and that being the kind of character or strength and thinking about that as like the cake topper to the Capitol Dome, you know, and then the ways in which uh, bodies are rendered invisible by these kind of architectural projects. And of course, seeing your work, we are kind of brought up against recent history. Can you talk about the relationship between your engagement with historic topics and the way in which perhaps the work is pointing to the present. I just, um, I think my obsession with history or that being the foundational layer for everything is that we can't understand where we are without looking backwards. And then the kind of fabricated lies and mythologies that have been presented to us and we know that there is all of these missing information through that, like missing lives, you know, voices and material that would actually better inform the way that we see ourselves and, and how this nation engages uh, globally, politically. And so I, I think, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna stop right there. <laughs> Thank you for that. So Raquel and Michalina, I want to bring you back into this because what's so apparent when you were in the space is the conversation between the works of art, the ways in which they are exploring different ideas and themes, but there's a kind of interesting collision where they rub up against each other intellectually, aesthetically, even emotionally. 
right? All of them require you to kind of put your body in relation to the work itself. So can you talk from a curatorial perspective about the conversation that you hoped would happen between the works themselves? I think a lot of, for us and specifically for me, some of the conversations that I were hoping that there's similarities and then there's differences. And the similarities are both in strengths and sort of, which is very exciting in the way in which all of the works have this like very sensual and opulent and yet psychological element to them, right? That really allows the viewer to be at the center. Um, so in each, in each sort of monumental piece, the viewer is one and given in sort of the nature of our current environment, that was very exciting that this was an opportunity for a, a sort of a viewer to engage with the piece, but also with each of the pieces separately, right? But also stand back and sort of visually take them in as a whole but they can go all inside. There was this centering, right? There's sort of this opening that they sort of can enter and just be one with the work and this slowing down, right? The slowing down moment of sort of time and space to allow you to be with the material, to be with the sound, to be with the visual, to be with all the other elements in the room, you and the work. And that was very exciting um, from my perspective with all of the uh, individual pieces. Yeah. So it seems that the language of scale mm -hmm. is at the base here, and it's the vocabulary with which you all worked. Can you talk about, in general, in your practices, your relationships to scale? Um, Abigail, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I think originally well, my, my thinking, maybe going back 12 years now or something, was thinking about reconciling this space of, of interiority or the kind of compressed spaces of like New York City apartments or specifically a housing project apartment versus the infinite expanse of the cosmos, right? And that the same elements that are in the stars are within our bodies or within the apartments and the spaces in which we dwell in and kind of the small ways in which we're limited of, of understanding ourselves, our place in the world, our time in history, and actually where we are in this kind of idea of time, right? Like that we don't actually really understand time and so then where are we in that and so uh i think i've always liked things big i mean i'm just not na naturally naturally my scale is big so uh this this wasn't this wasn't that hard for me and i was super happy that they asked me to do it <laughs> so thank y'all <laughs> thank you abigail rosa <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is definitely the biggest thing I've ever done in uh, scale as well as, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I think um, for me, I'm, I'm quite interested in how if you, because oh, I guess I'm interested so much in popular culture and everyday life, I'm interested in how if you can take something that's usually quite small, that we're used, very used to seeing at a very specific scale, such as like an old TV or, um, yeah, these kind of archival photographs and really like blowing them up really big, how it can make you maybe look twice. Um, in a lot of my work, I'm quite interested in um, uh, pantomime, which is another like really curious British form of theatre, where um, often things are yeah at overblown scales or like 1.5 times the usual scale C. So it's just a bit uncanny. And I think um, that uncanniness maybe has the power to, um, I hope, to make the viewer think twice when they see that object again at its normal scale outside the gallery, maybe in their homes. So um, yeah, when making these works, that, that was a nice opportunity for me to go really big um, in order to highlight or question. Yeah. Zai? <laughs> um, I hope I, I'm, I hope I don't get emotional about scale because, you know, when I think about scale, I'm always thinking about the American project. I'm always involved with the American project. And I'm always thinking about who has access to scale. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I'm always thinking about our history. I, you know, I've said this many times, you know, being African-American, being a descendant of slavery, all that that means in terms of like how our scale has been expanded and magnified in one way for labor and production and then also how it's been kind of continuously decimated and our opportunities for scale i think a lot about everyone's favorites i love a, i love a i'm not i'm going to say it i love a richard sarah like the next one but i think a lot about who has been given the resources to to produce at scale i think about the studio museum every day practically. And I think about, I like, I literally do not want Thelma to have to do anything, but just be, that building is just going up and the scale should be what Thelma decides it wants to be. And I, and uh, you know, and I, and I think about that. So for me, scale has to do with resources. It has to do with, being given the opportunity, but not even given the opportunity because it's our labor that built the thing, which is, you know, so it's like, how can you continue, especially when we walk in these bodies, how can you continue to expand that scale here and get, and, and, and make certain that, that our minds are, are um, given the breadth and depth that they need. I think a lot about you, Thelma, because I think, I know that you, um, study with James Baldwin. And I oftentimes think about him and I think about his, the repetition of conversation. And I think about the scale of his mind. I think about how every day he literally blows my mind. And I think about how large our society or how better and how large our society would be if he, just him alone, had been given the depth and scale of resources, attention, care, love, respect that that mind is supposed to have. That is what I think about when I think about scale. So it's, and, and I'll end with saying much love to Micheline and Raquel, but especially Micheline, because Micheline is an artist. Micheline could take her, her scale and her resources and make her own work. And what she did was multiply, you know, I'm gonna sound like a hippie. She multiplied love, you know what I mean? She multiplied abundance, love, trust, care, all the things, sensuality. She shares her family with us. You know, I mean, that's, 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 that's what we're here for. And, 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 and to see all these beautiful black women talking about scale and depth is, is, is it's everything. Like I could cry right now. And I'm gonna take up a five, one more minute and say, I remember going to see, I, I know Thelma, you, <laughs> I'm gonna say, I remember being small, going to see black male. I remember being uh, slightly small or teenage small, maybe I was an adult. I'm trying to make myself younger. Maybe I was teenage, a middle, I don't know, I was in my twenties and seeing, or maybe older, Chris Ophelia and the scale. You gave that man a whole room, that a whole museum. That is and and beyond. And we 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 were scale and we were resources, you know what I mean, for 300 plus years. So we need, we need about a 300 plus year debt payment <laughs> and we need to be able to live at the intellectual, material, physical scale that we rightfully are, should have, and will be. So that's what I think about when I think about scale. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So Micheline and Raquel, you know, I know so much of this project is infused with your politic around creating space for women artists, for black artists, for BIPOC artists, for queer, trans, intersectional artists, really thinking broadly about creating space for um, artists where that has not been the case. So can you talk about the way that informs specifically how you not only made this exhibition, but are thinking beyond this exhibition? Um, the scale, physical scale of the works, um, as Xavier had stated, you know, black 
uh, women and, or men really are rarely given the opportunity for scale, right? It's always white male artists. Um, and so it, that's important to us. It's important to us to, um, to show the world like we deserve the exact same that, that everyone else is given, right? Mm -hmm. We deserve the exact same opportunities because look at what happens when we get them. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and how much have we lost by not being given that opportunity? How much has our community and our world really lost by not being given the opportunity to go big, to to have that scale? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, with Du Femme Noir, it's um, we we want to go big, um, and we so will go big. <laughs> we will. <laughs> but it's it's going to take time, right? And and we're trying to build that up little by little with whatever resources we have. And as we gain more resources, we are, the the goal is to give away our our opportunities. Really, um, mm -hmm. if when people come to us and say we want you to do something, we're always thinking, well, wait a minute, there's somebody I'm else that can do this. Yeah. We have, we've been given a lot of opportunities, right? And the only way to make sure that that continues is to pass it on if we have, if we're able to, so that there are more of us. And, and the more of us that they see, then it can't be denied, mm -hmm. right? But they can no longer deny that we deserve that place and that platform. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. that's- And to, and read, to, you know, just also add to that, you know, the conversation with, you know, all of the panelists and with Zyberia saying is that the possibilities are infinite. And the fact of the matter is that the world is abundant. <laughs> there's so much abundance and there's enough for, for everyone. But oftentimes it's presented with limitations with black and brown bodies, right? We're presented with sort of, sort of roadblocks and sort of just, you know, constant limitations of what it perceives to be at times uh, um, possibilities of being monumental is sort of real down to like, actually we can't, right? There's been a lot of situations where, you know, whether it's working with institutions where they want you for a project and they'll say, you know, just think big, just whatever you need. And then when you go to, to figure out, when you come up with your idea, and, and your, 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 your project, then it's sort of like, oh, we don't have the budget for that. Yeah. But then you, but you, constraints there's constraints, but us. then you see them doing sort of amazing things with other artists. Right. <laughs> and then you look at yourself you're like, okay, why am I not given those opportunity? <laughs> why am I not given those same opportunity when it comes to the conversation? And I, this was a great possibility to just provide that again, platform, right, as you will, to artists who are so deserving, who we've watched their careers, we've watched and sort of, we follow their careers and we are inspired and appreciate what they're doing. And we see others getting the same, it's some of the same artists getting those opportunities. And I often say, I was like, I feel you should be doing this. Why isn't we she go in the that? shows and we're like, where, wait, there's <laughs> yeah. so many artists we think we, of that there's should a have list. been in that. And we're like, this person, <laughs> that person should be doing this. And are, you know, you see a public art fund and it's like a list of male artists getting <laughs> these platforms. And we're like, well, it's such and such could, you know? And so for us, when we're presented with that opportunity and first and foremost, when we are approached to do these projects, we always say, first, we need to talk about the budget and what are you going to be doing for the artists? And if the artist, you know, is there a stipend? Is there so that my goal is when artists are working, that they're working without stress, mm -hmm. right? So that they can have the creative process in their studio to make the art, <laughs> to make the work. It is not fun trying to create under distress, right? You know, that's the beauty of being an artist, is that you have the resources to create your ideas, mm -hmm. to manifest them. And if we're, if it's constant restrictions, it's, it's really challenging and hard to go back to the studio oftentimes because you're discouraged. And I think one of our main goals and my goals, I really, to be quite honest, Thelma, mm -hmm. I get very excited when I'm supporting other artists. Mm -hmm. It really, gives me such gratitude and, and joy to, to see other artists being successful. 
And so like Raquel said, when opportunities come, I'm always giving them to other artists and saying, hey, you know, I can't do this, but this is an artist you should be yeah. looking at. And here's an artist that should, is deserving of this project. You know, I'm not afraid. I have, to me, that's not my ego because no. I, I have the, the faith that I'm going to get what I need. <laughs> You, you know what I mean? As an artist. And I remember a long time ago, Thelma, I, I'm not sure if you do, when we we're at Studio Museum and I sort of came up with this, wanting to create some kind of scholarship <laughs> for for the Studio Museum and, and I didn't have, I didn't know how I was going to, and I was like, there should be a scholarship for Black artists. And it was more for like materials or production. Mm -hmm. And so even back then, I was trying to think of other artists of how the residents can give back to other artists who were coming in. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's that it really goes to that you have been thinking about creating space and creating community, mm -hmm. but also to kind of lift up and consider all the possibilities there. With that, uh, we have an audience that I know has lots of questions and I'm gonna turn it over to Dan in a moment, but I'd love to ask Abigail Saveria and Rosa, if they might um, just speak a little bit about what's inspiring or instigating their creative practices right now. I think um, I'm really interested in education and um, thinking about um, the possibilities for um, yeah radical black curriculum um, in the UK, many schools and universities. Um, there is no black history taught still today um, in schools from a young age or yeah, or when you get older. So I'm really interested in alternative spaces that can be created to um, um, educate in a like non-didactic way and I think art has a really big role to play in this for the British black community so I'm quite interested in in that at the moment um, and, and really experimenting with that space. Hmm, that's a good one you know I think because I have spent so much time with a clenched jaw and like kind of like you know I, I, I used to, I boxed for a really long time so I'm actually, as much as I'm interested in, um, you know, traditional art practices, I'm also introduced, interested in institutional critique um, in the 21st century, if you want to say. And I'm, and I'm also really interested in the sensual, you know, I, I really, I think oftentimes our body, our, our, our minds, especially as artists, you know, we, we, we lose a sensual thing because we're very much about the materials and the, the the intellectual processing and the political and the abstract and the activist and the abolition which is all I love it you know I love thinking about museums and I love thinking about art and labor but I also really love thinking about how to activate people sensually so it's 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 toggling those two things um and then I really love working with young folks, young folks, you know, college age and a bit older who are really interested in, you know, how institutions can shift, how um, our whole entire world really can shift. And they, they've proven that by how they operate on ground. So how can I be, you know, not a, not a elder, but more a, a friend. I mean, I am, an elder, but I'm also a friend. And how can I be a colleague to, to, to people who are younger than me, who, who need support and guidance and inspiration? So I think that all of those things. And Abigail, you know, it's been a, a real gift this year to be able to have your work exist in public, in public space, Madison Square Park, and now this installation. So what's been inspiring you in this moment? I guess, um... The thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately is to what actually, what does freedom mean? Mm -hmm. And the kind of unknowingness like embedded within that, it's a complete abstraction and we only know it when it's in contrast to, to you know, to what it's not. And mm -hmm. so then, so then what does that actually mean? And how are we making space for that? And uh, something else that I think about a lot also, and uh, as I've mentioned James Baldwin earlier, but that creative process essay from 1962 in the last line where he talks about that an artist's war with his society is a lover's war and he does 
what lovers do, which is to reveal the beloved to himself. And I, I think, you know, how is it that I can center love through a kind of truth telling or revealing through material that already exists within, you know, our same space and time? Like how are there patterns like from our fingertips to, you know, like the birth of the universe, right? How those two things are in correlation with one another with the formation of spider webs and everything else. But anyway, but they, you know, I'm getting off, but um, you know, but I'm thinking, thinking about freedom basically. And, and what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. And how, how can we talk about that? Mm, thank you for that. I'm now gonna invite my colleague, Dayan Huff to join us and she's going to moderate the Q and A. So please join us, Dayan, welcome. Hey, Thelma, thank you. Hi everyone, Abigail, that last quote, I'm like literally shook, like just needed a beat to take it. Yeah, I needed to take that in. Thank you for that. Um, so we just have a few questions from the audience that some of these are more technical because I think people like the curtain getting pulled back to understand process. But I would be really curious for all the artists to talk about like the process of actually constructing these monumental works. Um, for some of you, this was kind of a new endeavor, um, but just those steps of, of how to navigate scale and building i'll go first because <laughs> i mean and and you know i'm going to ask nicolene and raquel to come in to just talk with me about the process of building that piece but i will say to everyone that there were probably i don't know 15 different hands on the orbs you know from you know we had we had who the main um constructor or ceramicist was nick What's Nick's last name? Oh, Nick O, mm -hmm. um, who's an amazing artist himself. And he kind of like, he kind of ushered, he was in the middle of the circle. And then he ushered in, you know, gotta be, I don't know, 10, 15 different hands. It was who, phenomenal and just coming into was, space and yeah. Clay was, dust everywhere. We had three kilns going at the same time. The, um, the and, smell and, of it, the clay, yeah. the earth, and just watching them. Yeah. But yeah. then, but but then, once that was produced, then you had, you know, Pioneer Works come in mm. and and figure out how to make these. And figure out how to build it. Like I, came yeah. in with a sketch. I came in yeah. with like this is the object that I want to make, and I wanted to make it out of these materials. And then Pioneer Works came in with, I'm talking four, three, four forklifts, <laughs> cherry pick, all of it, you know? So, I mean, it was a real group effort and I can only thank obviously Michalina and Raquel, but um, the whole team at Pioneer Works plus the ceramicists who are just dynamite. And then on top of it, you know, I have my studio where we made the films, the, the, the animated works um the text works i mean it, you know it takes a it takes a whole village really it takes a crew you know i have a lot of support i mean it's something i want to say to young folks just in general is when you see us you're seeing a community like me myself you, you know me but i'm not really just me i am like a a, a, a an imagination of thelma's partially you know of different institutions you know, in this instance of Michalina Raquel and all the support, like I, none of us are just singular artists out here building the thing. <laughs> you know, we come, we are a community and a crew really, or, you know, so I just want young folks to know that, that it's, that it, that it takes, a, it takes a whole community for these objects and projects to happen. It's not just our singular brilliance. Rosa Rabico, would you like to? The Pyramid is something that I had tried and, and did in a performance that I think really failed um, maybe about four or five years ago at this point. And so I've been thinking about it over and over again as like this trash can pyramid. And those trash cans themselves were decommissioned trash cans from a social security building in Baltimore. And they have the names of the people whose offices that they belong to. And they reminded me of growing up in New York City as of the public school trash cans that we had in our classrooms in the 80s and 90s. And so uh, like instantly I fell in love with them, but also simultaneously, there is a, um, an amazing museum called the Great Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore. If you have a chance to go, you should go. It's uh, 
so many interesting installations and ways of handling sculpture and history and storytelling that I think school children from like age six and seven are traumatized by people that I know from Baltimore have told me that they have been traumatized by this space because one installation in particular is the belly of, of the slave ship through the middle passage. And it's that that installation in particular is, I don't know how this, this will make sense for all of you, but for some reason I have like in my mind fused together these trash cans and this idea of these compartmentalized spaces through the middle passage and then thinking about the names that are already inscribed on the cans and then thinking about ways that I could structure this that people would have a different kind of understanding of you know federal projects or kinds of um, federalist architecture. But then uh, the all of this actually the planning was done with a, a, a friend of mine, Spencer, who laid out you know so many technical plans for the fabricators who made the actual KC fabrications made the steel dome and it wasn't until I was actually in the dome for the first time that I knew how to handle the material to cover it. I knew what the structure was but it's something different to have all of these ideas be hypotheticals and drawings and then actually being in a space and then how that space informs on how it wants to be treated and, and, and shaped. And so then uh, the cosmos actually was uh, the black plastic that's, that's stabbed in the back on those windows behind Mc, uh, Michelina Raquel. Um, that was a group effort. I think a lot of people helped in that. I think there's video footage of Michelin and Raquel stabbing some plastic. So yes, that that was that's requires an infinite amount of labor and there was lots of hands that, that uh, had their hand in that. Uh, I think that for me, it really, um, uh, it was very strange, like not being able to like feel the materials that I was working with, but I guess um, it kind of forced me to return to um, architecture, which is actually what I did before I became an artist. And um, just really like, yeah, working with simply with, with CADs, doing the drawings, trying to communicate. Um, an idea on a very uh, using very small materials, an idea that's going to be absolutely massive. Um, so it's, yeah, simply put, I used CAD, and then um, you know, um, but um, I, for me, it was really interesting to think about. I think you know, drawing like that, it really reminded me of when I was an architectural assistant and thinking about how I felt like it was in some ways going to be impossible for me as a young black woman to um, to become an architect to ever make anything um, that would be built on, on a big scale. So um, to actually um, kind of return to these kind of skills and, and, and work in this way again is really reflective. And, you know, a lot of what both um, Xavier and Abigail, you've, you've been talking about like architecture and and, and the possibilities and the potentialities for architecture as, as an immersive space for people, the ways that it can transmit meaning um, subconsciously as well as consciously, because it's very physical and about the way people move through space. I think, um, yeah, just returning to that, that way of working in terms of like design and then realization, that working process, it was very, um, yeah, reflective and, and quite emotional, even though very technical. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. I mean, also, it's beautiful to think about this, this notion that artists are like these solitary figures in their studios, like tinkering away and in the void away from publics. But like all of you are speaking so beautifully about the importance of community and collaboration, and all the hands that are necessary. And that feels like such a bigger statement about this moment and like the necessity of forces uniting in order to actually make these really beautiful monumental um, constructs possible. Um, so another question that came was um, to, to Raquel and Micheline, this, this question of, was there an overall narrative that you were trying to construct with this show as a whole? Thinking about of this dynamic trio um, and what you were really trying to speak to. Um, I guess we were trying to speak to uh, the, the political, uh, you know, what the, our times, what's happening currently um, and, and how, um, you know, we always look to, to artists to, uh, 
to kind of guide us through um, chaotic times, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to provide us with, with a way to really view um, what's happening. Um, and so, yeah, it was COVID, it was, mm -hmm. you know, and so we were just like, that's, that was kind of the, the narrative really, was just how are we all responding as artists to our current time? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the urgency uh, that, that we felt um, was going to be needed um, as we started <laughs> to climb out of um, everything we've all been through um, over, over the past year and saw this as an opportunity to, um, to, to speak about it, um, but not hit people over the head with it like this political, you know, but you know, in a nuanced way, um, as artists do, right? Mm -hmm. And and we knew at this point, you know, these were the three artists that would be able to do it, and they're all linked with an architectural, you know, background and you know, a process. Um, so that was important. Um, yeah, it it. But at mm -hmm. the same time, we wanted to give them complete freedom. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like this is what we want: is we want what you're feeling right now. Uh, what is it that's going through your mind? Um, and we want to just help you bring that out. Um, so we were, we're pretty loose as curators. <laughs> we're not, we're pretty much like, you know, very artist focused, very artist centric. We, we want the artists to come to us uh, uh, with, with what they want to do. And really. also just thinking about, as you know, Xiveria mentioned earlier, she had an idea in her sketchbook, right? You know, um, Abigail had, you know, her pyramid that fell, that it could come to fruition and realize that again. You know, Rosa not really, you know, finalizing the Black Perot or seeing that in sort of a different sort of light. Like all of these, those were opportunities, right? This was an opportunity to say, we have these other projects that, you know, we haven't really, uh, materialize to its fullest, right? And as an artist, those, you know, we spoke about limitation, we spoke about scale. It's oftentimes you have these ideas, well, whether they were failures, whether they were things that you didn't really complete or whether they were ideas in a sketchbook that you wanna go back to, right? And that's what we were asking them for. Like, where is that? Do you have any of those sort of con con concepts that you can sort of bring forward because here's an opportunity and we want to provide this for you to sort of bring that to light and we and, also yeah I'm and that's sorry, what it was yeah, you know it was, it was like what do you have something yeah. you know you have an idea that you know that you want to work with them and we also were very committed to having a voice that was not american um, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that was could speak very important to, that was very to, important for us. to what's going on and, and, you know, outside it's, it's the same, we're having the same conversations, mm -hmm. but how are we having them? Yeah. Um, and, and bringing Rosa, knowing that this was her, you know, first American debut, American debut <laughs> was very exciting yes. for us, you know, it was very <laughs> exciting for us. Her mm -hmm. work is very powerful and we were very just happy to have her voice and her creative creativity a part of the process. You know, we think they all, you know, Rose is gonna be here in June. And so we can't wait for all of us to be together, you know, um, and just, just for her to actually see what was materialized based on like her cat drawings and, and having faith in us you know, you know, across borders to, to, to like, <laughs> to on, Zoom. on Zoom. This is what this looks you like. Know? What do you think? Like, <laughs> sometimes WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we wish she, she could be here with us. And, and the initial thought was that she would come and do the residency yeah. here. Um, and then, you know, things happened and, uh, but we still wanted to make sure we could fulfill her vision yeah. uh, to the best of our abilities. And I hope that you're happy with what I we mean, did. I mean, it's just, that, you like, know, without being here, we succeeded in creating what you envisioned. And I just love being just in each space, you know, by myself, you know, it's just like this, you're, you're it, like, they all provide sort of this, almost performative but just like theatrical sort of element to it it's just, you look you're they each have texture and sort of color and sound and you're just consumed by sort of this 
element of sort of monumentality with their structures within another sort of architectural st structure, which is Pioneer Works, you know? And the fact that we actually were able to pull it off. <laughs> You know, I know, and to that, I have to really thank, thank Pioneer, Pioneer Works. Works. Yeah. I mean, we could not have done this without their incredible team. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and support, anything we asked, you know, it, it was never greeted with a, no, that's not possible. It was like, you know what, let's yeah. let's see if we can do this. And if we can't do it that way, we're, we're going to do this. If it's yeah. really important to you, we're going to do it. Yeah. And we'll figure it out. Because um, the space is, you know, you know, the architecture is like cavernous in its own you know, you know, so the sound, this, the, all of it, and we so were bringing the together, challenges yeah. for that. It's just like you know, it's it can be Things very we difficult. Didn't know. <laughs> and and we needed that, you know, that expertise, and and the guys here are just incredible. Everyone here really, really pitched in, stayed late. I yeah. mean, you know, people, I know I've never worked with the institution where people weren't trying to check out like at six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was three o'clock in the morning and I we'd come in and, you know, in the morning and at 10 a.m. And it was like, you know, half of the crew had had just a couple hours and they were so determined to, to make sure this was done right um, and so focused and it's, you just, you don't get that. No. Um, especially when, um, you know, they oftentimes don't get credited for it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so- And that was very that important commitment to commitment and yeah. passion was, mm -hmm. was really, I mean, we, we can't thank Pioneer Works yeah. and, and Gabriel and Vivian and, and everyone else for everything that they, that they did for us. Creating and speaking about community, like yeah. this Pioneer Works just has an incredible community of, you know, facilitators that allow artists to create amazing work. And that's why we wanted to work with them because we've seen all their other projects in the past. Mm -hmm. And we knew that they would be a sort of great collaborator for us to work with. And the passion and commitment <laughs> was there. Thank you so much. I think that's a really beautiful way of wrapping up this program. I'm going to reread the quote that Abigail said yeah. because I j just, because I think that's a, the war of an artist with his society is a lover's war, and he does at his best what lovers do, which is to reveal the beloved to himself and with that revelation to make freedom real. So this has been such an immense treat. Um, and I just wanna thank McLean, Raquel, Abigail, Rosa, Xaveria, and Thelma so much for this generous and generous, um, generative conversation. Additional thanks to the Pioneer Works staff on back end who made this program possible, Vivian Chu, Matthew Mann, Michael Jones, and Nim Barshad. Um, given that the weather has warmed up, because I think we are all slowly melting in our respective spaces, mm -hmm. the days are extending and more offerings are available to be experienced in person. We thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Brand New Heavies is on view until June 20th. So if you have the means, transport, and comfortability to make it to Red Hook to witness this incredible exhibition in person, I urge you to. The photos and video cannot quite truly capture the immersive, embodied, and expansive engagement that is seeing these works in the flesh. Um, so please check out Pioneer's website for hours and date time availability. Good evening, good night, and take care. Thank you all. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So good to see you all. Bye. Good evening.